Welcome back to this video. And in this video, we are going to discuss question two. Question two, it's talking about the movement of water across the cell membrane. So let me just read the statement that we have here before we start answering the questions. So the statement is, a patient X has been brought before you for quick medical help. A number of medical tests have revealed that she is highly dehydrated due to massive water loss as a result of a condition. Using your knowledge on water molecules and their movement in the human body, explain what led to the dehydration of patient X. So we are going to talk about the possible causes of dehydration in patient X. But we're just going to single out one, okay? You can talk about many as you want, but for us, we're just going to single out one important cause, and that is cholera. But before we talk about cholera or dehydration, we need to understand what dehydration is and how does water cross the cell membrane into the cell. So when you talk about dehydration, we're simply talking about excessive water loss from the human body. So when the water level in the human body is low or is below the normal, that is what we're calling dehydration. Because water is very important for maintaining homeostasis in the body and for other physiological purposes. So how does water cross the cell membrane? So we can look at this diagram that we have here. So we can look at this diagram that we have here. Water is able to enter into the cell directly. It's able to cross the cell membrane on its own without the use of proteins. But at the same time, water also uses some uh, proteins that we call aquaporins. So water is able to enter directly as well as using proteins that we call aquaporins. So aquaporins, these are simply integral membrane proteins that form water selective channels. So this is a channel where water is able to pass through and enter into the cytoplasm of the cell. So this is facilitated diffusion. So this is how water is able to penetrate the cell membrane or is able to enter into the cell. So here we want to talk about the possible causes of dehydration in a patient X. So we said we are going to talk about cholera. Okay? Because we know that cholera, it causes severe diarrhea and severe diarrhea it actually results in dehydration because a lot of water is being lost in diarrhea. There are a lot of things that you can talk about. You can talk about vomiting. Okay, you can talk about a lot of things as long as you're able to explain them using chemistry. Okay, but for us, in this case, we're going to talk about cholera. So we can actually look at this diagram. In this diagram, we have got this bacteria, which is called Vibrio cordillae. So cholera, it is actually caused by a bacteria called Vibrio cordillae. So Vibrio cordillae, it is actually a gram-negative bacteria. So this gram-negative bacteria, it actually releases a toxin that we call cholera toxin. So this toxin, it actually releases in the small intestine. So these bacteria, they invade the small intestine. So once they invade the small intestine, they, they release these cholera toxins. And what does these cholera toxins do? First of all, we need to understand that these cholera toxins, they are made up of two different subunits, the A subunits and the B subunits. We have got five domains for the B subunits. So we can see this is the B subunits, there are five domains. And for the A subunits, it is one, but it is able to be cleaved into A1 and A2 domains, okay? So what happens is that the Vibrio cholerae, it releases these toxins, the cholera toxins, in the what? In the small intestines. And in the small intestines, I've got these cells that lines the small intestines. So these cells that are found inside the small intestines are called enterocytes, okay? So these enterocytes, they have got receptors that we call GM1 gangliocyte receptors. So this is an enterocyte, and you can see this is the apical membrane. So the apical membrane, it is actually the side or the enterocyte cell that faces the lumen. So this is the lumen. The lumen is actually the passage inside the, inside the small intestine. So this is the lumen, and this is the side of the cell. This is the cell, and this is the side of the cell that is facing the lumen. So this side is called the apical membrane. And then this side that is far away from the lumen, it is called the basal part. So this is the basal part and this is the apical part of the cell. So when you look at the apical membrane of this enterocyte, we have got a receptor here that is called GM1 gangliocyte receptor. 
So this is a receptor where this cholera toxin binds. So when it binds on these receptors, what will happen is that it's going to be taken into the cell. Okay, so it's going to enter into the cell through endocytosis. So this is an endosome. Okay, so an endosome is simply like a vesicle. So this is a vesicle that is containing certain substances. So we've got this endosome, and this endosome is going to take this cholera toxin to the endoplasmic reticulum. So I'm simply talking about the pathogenesis of cholera here. Because once you understand the pathogenesis of cholera, we are going now to talk about how it causes water loss and diarrhea at the end of the day and dehydration. Okay? So this is how I'm supposed to explain that question. So this endosome is going to take the cholera toxin to the endoplasmic reticulum of the enterocytes. So in this endoplasmic reticulum, the cholera toxin is going to be cleaved. Which part is going to be cleaved? Specifically, the A subunit is going to be cleaved into cholera toxin A1 and cholera toxin A2. Okay? So this is the A subunit is going to be cleaved. I said this A subunit is made up of A1 and A2 parts. Okay? So it's going to be cleaved into cholera toxin A1 and cholera toxin A2, which hasn't been showed here. Okay? So this is cholera toxin A2. Yeah, the one that is remaining on the toxin. So this is cholera toxin A2 subunit or domain, in other words. So this is the domain, the A2 domain. It will still remain bound to the B subunit. Then the cholera toxin A1 is going to be separated and it's going to be taken to the outside, to the cytosome. Okay? So this is going to remain and the cholera toxin A1 is going to be taken out to the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum. So here outside, we have got this G protein. So if you remember the G protein, the G protein has got actually three subunits. The G alpha subunit, the G beta subunit, and the G gamma subunit. So what happens is that for G protein to be activated, we know that there is an exchange of GDP for GTP. Okay? So here at the subunit, there is going to be an exchange of GDP for GTP. And it means that the G protein is going to be active. And when it is active, when GTP is binding, is binding to the alpha subunit of the G protein, it means that it is active. And when it is active, it is able to activate an enzyme that we call adenylate cyclase. And adenylate cyclase, it converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP, it activates an enzyme which is called protein kinase A. And protein kinase A has got a lot of phosphorylation activities. Okay, but, but for this G protein to become inactive, GTP must be removed from the alpha subunit and it's going to be replaced with GDP. Okay, that's what happens normally. And this G protein is going to become inactive. When it becomes inactive, it means that adenylate cyclase is also going to become inactive as well as there's going to be low level of cyclic AMP. And once cyclic AMP is low, it means that protein kinase A is going to be inhibited and it will stop working. But when it comes to the cholera toxin A1 subunit, this is an enzyme. So this enzyme, what it does is that it blocks, it, blo it blocks actually, or in other words, it locks the GTP on the alpha subunit of G protein. So it's going to lock the GTP such that the GTP cannot leave. Okay? The GTP cannot be replaced by the GDP. So the GTP is going to bind permanently on the alpha subunit. And what does it mean? It means that it means that adenylate cyclase enzyme is going to be active. So it's, this, so this enzyme is going to be active. And what will happen is that we are going to have elevated level of cyclic AMP and we are going to activate protein kinase A continuously. Okay. So in other words, is that this this site, this cholera toxin A1, it prevents the inhibition of protein kinase A. So protein kinase A is going to be active continuously. And what is the effect of that? Protein kinase A, there is a protein here. There is actually a protein here, a transmembrane protein. What do we call this transmembrane protein? This transmembrane protein, it is actually called 
cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator okay so we have got cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator this is a protein that is found on the apical membrane of the enterocytes so what happens is that this it is activated by protein kinase a so if you have got protein kinase a that is active okay because protein kinase a is an enzyme so if you have got protein kinase a that is continuously active it's going to activate this cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator and once this is activated it's a channel it's going to open and when it opens what will happen is that eh, chloride is going to flow from the intracellular matrix to the extracellular matrix so chloride ions is going to move we we'll start moving migrating from the cytosol going to the outside to the lumen so as it is moving because chloride ions these ions are osmotically active what do we mean they draw water okay so wherever they go they go with water so as chloride is leaving from here to here it's going to go with water so water starts also leaving we we'll start closing okay remember what we said our water moves across the cell membrane it uses aquaporins and it's also able to close directly so water starts closing into the lumen okay so when this continues a lot of water is going to leave the cell that's what happens and when a lot of water leaves the cell you're going to find that the cell is going to start shrinking in size it's going to start shrinking so this is actually a problem so this will cause diarrhea because you find that a lot of water will be lost so this is what happens okay so now let us quickly go to question b Question B, it is saying, Dr. Aria has suggested that the patient be given a lot of pure water to stop continued loss of water from the cells of the patient. Discuss the biochemical implication of this suggestion. So, so, do you think pure water can actually dissolve this problem? And if you don't think so, why? Personally, I don't think pure water can resolve this problem. But why okay we need to ask ourselves what's what's the reason behind that why am i saying so okay so i'm going to explain if you remember we talked about the movement of water across the cell membrane we said that water actually goes to where the osmotically active particles goes so osmotically active particles we have got particles like glucose chloride ions sodium ions and stuff like that so what happens is that when sodium enters into the cell you find that water will also follow let us say that we've got a lot of sodium ions inside the cell and outside the cell what will happen to water is that water starts moving from outside the cell into the inside of the cell so that it dilutes the sodium ions that are concentrated inside the cell that's the purpose of water if we had a lot of sodium ions outside the cell the same thing will happen water starts leaving the cell going to the outside so what can we do with this patient who is having diarrhea and is losing a lot of water why can we can we, can we not give this patient pure water the reason why you cannot give this patient pure water is that pure water alone is not going to bring any change because pure water alone will just come out through urine will be excreted immediately so what do we have to do we have to add electrolytes so electrolytes here are simply charged particles okay we have to add electrolytes as well as glucose why are we adding glucose and electrolytes specifically what we are going to add is sodium ions the reason we are adding sodium ions and glucose is because we want to actually be able to transport glucose into the cell as well as sodium into the cell. So even a glucose is one of the osmotically active particles. Okay? So what can we do with this patient? This patient should be given ORS, oral rehydration salt. ORS it actually contains sodium chloride, which is salt, and the glucose dissolved in water not pure water because pure water once it is taken it cannot enter into the cell so for us to understand why we cannot give this patient pure water we need first to understand how water is transported across the cell membrane so remember what i said i initially mentioned that water follows where osmotically active particles goes so osmotically active particles we're simply talking about particles such as sodium ions chloride ions glucose and other molecules so these molecules are very important in the movement of water so imagine that we have got a lot of sodium outside the cell what will happen is that water starts flowing from inside the cell to the outside the cell so that it can dilute the concentrated sodium ions outside the cell 
So giving a patient who is dehydrated or who is having cholera, pure water cannot actually resolve the problem. Because remember we said that in a cholera, chloride ions, they are moving from the cytosol to the lumen. Or in other words, they are moving from inside the cell to the outside the cell. So those chloride ions that they are moving, they are moving with water. So for us to move water back into the cell, we need to find osmotically active particles. We need to move osmotically active particles into the cell, back into the cell. So once we move osmotically active particles into inside the cell, then water will also follow. So what we are going to do is that this patient should be given what we call ORS, oral dehydration salt, because ORS contains sodium, chloride ions, as well as sugar, which is glucose. But why does it contain sodium ions and glucose? The reason is simple. Sodium ions, it is one of the main osmotically active particles that are found in the body. So sodium ions, what happens is that it is important for secondary active transport of glucose. Remember, in the first video, we talked about this transporter, which we call the sodium glucose transporter. This transporter, it actually transports sodium ions and the glucose molecules across the cell membrane into inside the cell. So for this transporter to work, it actually needs both sodium ions and glucose molecules presence. So if you have got glucose and you don't have sodium ions, this transporter cannot work. If you have got sodium ions and you don't have glucose, this transporter cannot work. So ORS contains both sodium ions and glucose. So sodium, and, sodium ions and glucose, when it is given to a patient, let's say who is dehydrated, what will happen is that sodium ions and glucose, they will bind to this transporter and they will be transported into the cell. So we are going to have a lot of sodium ions and glucose molecules inside the cell. And that is very important. Once, the, once this place, the cytosol of the cell, is concentrated with these particles, or significantly active particles, you find that water starts moving from outside the cell into inside the cell. Water starts following these particles. And that will result in rehydration. So we are going to replace water that was lost from here. So that's why we cannot give this patient pure water because pure water doesn't contain any electrolytes. So the best thing to do is to add the sodium, sodium chloride to this pure water as well as the glucose. Because sodium chloride and the glucose, they are going to activate the sodium glucose transporter and they're going to transport, and it's going to transport sodium ion and the glucose molecules into the cell. And that will result in the movement of water from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment. And this is going to be helpful to the cell. So this is the mechanism. That's how you're supposed to explain that. So when you look at question C, so question C, we've actually talked about this, and a question B. So question C it is asking us the management. What management can you suggest to help prevent further dehydration in the patient X? Give convincing medical reasons. So the management for this condition, which is cholera or diarrhea, in other words, it is actually giving this patient ORS. So ORS, remember what we said? is going to allow the uptake of water into the cell through the sodium, through the action of sodium glucose transporters. Because sodium glucose transporters they are going to transport sodium ions and glucose into the cell, which as a result will drive water into the cell. That is a mechanism. I've actually talked about this under question B.